That is. I am not in Alachua. I'm in Mexico. That is a backdrop. That is my backdrop from my room. If you're wondering. Ma Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Shami Tinamane Namaste Shara Shati Devi. Gauravani Pacharine Nirvisesa Sanyavadi Pashati Vasatarine. The other day I heard something very interesting about the mind and I thought, uh, that idea that I heard stuck to my mind and I thought, we should talk about this. And I want to make a um, disclaimer that what I teach will be very easy to understand and all of you will find most likely difficult to do it. But it can be done and it's very important. And uh, I'll try my best to to um, help you understand the topic. And basically the topic is dealing with the mind. So the thing I heard that I like so much was the idea that you can retrain your mind how to think. So as conditioned souls, the mind thinks a certain way. And we take it for granted how it thinks because it naturally thinks a certain way. But as you know, it doesn't always think the way we want it to think. It often thinks against us. So in retraining the mind, we have to start thinking the way we want to think and acting as if the mind thinks that way. And the mind starts thinking, wait a minute, you don't want me to think the old way, you want me to think the new way. And you tell the mind, yeah, this is the new way. This is the new way we're thinking, this is the new way we're acting, this is the new way we're feeling, this is the new way we're believing. Like sometimes we do affirmations. In the self-care course, we did lots of affirmations. We have the Jaffa affirmation book. The affirmations are telling the mind, this is how I want you to think. You don't think this way. I want you to think this way. So you're, you're making a statement like, I like to chant Jaffa. And the mind is saying, no, you don't. And you're saying, no, we're not going to think I don't anymore. We're going to think I do. Because I know as a spirit soul, I like it. And I know logically I like it because it's going to get me back to Godhead. So you're telling me I can't chant Japa well. I don't like it. And we're not going to do that anymore. Uh, and so I sit down to chant Japa and I tell myself, I like to chant. And the mind says, oh, so that's the way you want me to think now? You're, you're telling your mind you're reprogramming it. So I thought that was an interesting idea. I've spoken about it also. And I, I want to speak more about it. So the fundamental principle of this is that the mind is conditioned by unlimited lifetimes. So it's conditioned to think in a certain way. And so when you become a devotee, you make an assumption that now that I'm hearing the philosophy and I know what I should be doing, the mind will just do it. Did you make that assumption? It just, it just seems logical. Well, you know, it's like we're doing something different, so the mind's just going to come along and do the same thing. And then you very soon find out the mind doesn't always do that. It does it sometimes, but it doesn't always do it. And oftentimes it brings up this, the old programming, just as it was before you were a devotee. So you, the soul, made a decision, I want to surrender my life to Krishna. It doesn't mean the mind made that decision. You have to help the mind make the decision. We assume if I make the decision, the mind makes the decision, but that's not always the case. Sometimes 
after we make the decision, we have to start talking to the mind to make the decision. And what what is the proof of that? Well, I think one of the one of the proofs of that is the song by Govinda Das, Maya, and he's praying to his mind. He's having a conversation with his mind. Okay, mind, this is what we're doing, and this is what we're not doing. Now, I, I'm taking shelter at Krishna's lotus feet, and um, you know, I've I've been under the influence of Maya and uh, laboring hard for sense gratification. So we're not doing that anymore. So what we're doing is we're taking shelter of Krishna's lotus feet, and that's the program. So the idea is th that he's already made a decision to do that, but he understands his mind hasn't necessarily made the same decision. The mind may, <laughs> he may decide to go up, and the mind says, well, you programmed me to go down, so even though you as the soul or or even intelligence has decided to go up, I just naturally go down because that's what you've taught me. All right. So if you're if you're ever like um if you're ever like frustrated with the way your mind thinks, it's it, not ever, it happens. Um First thought is, but the mind is only thinking the way I trained it. It's not like a separate entity. So this is important because the mind feels like um, it's controlling us. The mind, the mind feels sometimes like it's an entity we have no control of, right? My mind is very powerful. Arjuna said that to Krishna, the mind stronger than the wind. So sometimes we feel like we have no control over it, but it's, it's important to remember that whatever the mind's doing, it was us who programmed it, or at least it was us who agreed to allow it to be programmed by the modes of nature. That we were. It's not like we're helpless and the mind's just going everywhere and we have nothing to do. That's a that thought will kill you. And I know sometimes it feels like that, doesn't it? Right. Well, we always have a choice. Um, Krishna gave us that choice. Sometimes when we're in the mode of ignorance, we can't, we don't have the energy to exert the choice, but we always have it. And um, of course, you want to keep yourself in a in a, a lifestyle. That's more sattvic because in sattvaguna, that's where you'll have the biggest choice of controlling yourself. You get into passions harder and ignorance is almost impossible. Your willpower is the weakest in ignorance. So understanding that I am the programmer of the mind, I want to be, I don't want to be in ignorance because then the mind will overpower me. So, so we understand when the mind is dictating something which is detrimental to us. It's that conditioned mind. And if you analyze what it's dictating and you think about it from a materialistic point of view, it makes sense that if I, as a material, I, as a materialistic person, would want the mind to think that way, the jealousy, the envy, the lust, the greed, all those things, we as materialists would, would determine to be useful for material life, right? This guy's in the way, let's, let's get him out of the way. I hate him, I'm envious of him. Um, let's enjoy, let's enjoy as much as we can so the mind will uh, allure you to things which are enjoyable because that's what you do as a materialist. So when the mind comes up with whatever it comes up with, just understand from the material perspective, that's completely normal. There's like nothing wrong with it. It's only wrong with it when you're trying to be a devotee. Then it's like, oh, this is not good. I'm envious, I'm jealous, I'm greedy, I'm lusty. That was good for material life. It's not good for spiritual life, but it was it was programmed for material life, right? It's like it's like bringing up, uh, you know, a Excel sheet to, to, to write an essay. Well, it's the wrong program. You got to open Word if you want to write an essay, right? Yes, so so 
So the point is that we have to recondition the mind. We can't assume because we've we've become devotees, the minds are going to become a devotee also. It doesn't. You actually have to work on it. At least it doesn't entirely, and you all know that from your own experience, right? And as as soon as we're where our rounds are bad, we we minimize our sadhana, we don't get good association, the mind starts gravitating towards its natural material inclinations, doesn't it? Yeah. So it's it's easy to understand how it's programmed. So now um we want to program it. Um, this class maybe we'll go for another hour. Something like that. And you don't have to stay for the whole class. Um, so we as so when we become devotees, we have to work on reprogramming it. So the mind is supporting our bhakti. And um in, in other classes I I've mentioned that sometimes when your mind is misdirecting you, you have to stand up and say, no, we're not doing that. And just talk to it and say, no, we're, that, that's not what we're doing. This is what we're doing. And just affirm. That's what an affirmation is. An affirmation is affirming what you want to do because the mind doesn't want to do it. The mind has its own affirmations. What? The mind affirms, we are going to sleep because we feel sleepy. We're not going to chant our rounds now because we feel lazy. We're not going to read Bhagavatam because I don't like to study. Yeah, so the mind has its own affirmations, right? Or you can call them naffirmations. They're negative in the negative, right? So, so the idea of an affirmation is to affirm what you actually want because the mind will affirm what it wants. And if you don't affirm what you want, then you get what your mind, what you trained your mind to give you for millions of lifetimes, which is is often not going to be very helpful. It, it, there may be some things you trained your mind in, but it's not always very helpful as we know, right? So, an affirmation is, in a sense, like a conversation with a mind, my dear mind. We we are not going to do this, and we are going to do this. This is what, we, my dear mind, this is what we want. This is what we like. Um, yesterday, uh, last two days in classes, we were talking about how powerful it is to be able to turn away, to walk away from something which is unhealthy. And how powerful it is to be able to do or act according to what you know to be right. And that requires, it requires um, not, I would say it, it requires more than discipline. It's a deeper, it's something much deeper than that. It requires a, a keen intelligence that can understand the importance and value of doing the right thing and then conditioning the mind to do that. Conditioning the mind to pull away from what is bad and walk towards what is good. Now, wouldn't that be good if you could condition yourself like that? You naturally walked away from what was harmful. You naturally walked towards what was good. That would make your life a lot easier. You naturally walk towards what you know to be true and valuable. You naturally walk away from what is harmful. Wouldn't that be good? Now, we can train ourselves to do that. And um, I'm going to have to, and I think you already know this, say it's not easy to do that because you know, like Prabhupada said, come, like Prabhupada said, it's like, have you ever heard this saying? Prabhupada said that to, to train, to train a conditioned soul is like trying to straighten the tail of a dog. 
Have you ever heard that before? Have you ever wondered why it's difficult, difficult to become Krishna conscious? Because you're trying to straighten the tail of a dog. Your conditioning, your, our habits are like a... Or Prabhupada once joked and said... Prabhupada once joked and said, trying to make us Krishna conscious is like trying to clean coal. Trying to, yeah, so, um, you know, if, if you don't understand that analogy, um, I suggest you go get a piece of coal and try to clean it, and uh, you'll understand that. It just makes a mess, no matter how much you try to clean it. And, uh, you know, sometimes it can be discouraging when you, because you've been trying to straighten that dog's tail for a long time, you know, and it's like, it's really not working. So I think Arjun's, Ar, I think Arjun's statement in, in the Gita is interesting because it reflects this feeling like, you know, it seems impossible to control the mind. And if that's true, if it's impossible to control the mind, then we're simply at the mercy of the forces of nature, right? Like if it's actually impossible to control the mind, then we're totally at the mercy of what's ever going on in our lives, in our environment, in our conditioning. And we have absolutely no control. And some scientists you know, believe that because they think, Consciousness is material. So Arjun says, yeah, it seems impossible. It seems easier to control the wind. In other words, like this is probably the most difficult thing. And then Krishna says, well, it's really funny because devotees often quote the Gita and say the mind is more difficult to control than the wind. But the interesting thing about that is that's not what Krishna said. That's what Arjuna said. So you can't quote the Gita to validate how difficult it is to control your mind because Arjuna was speaking as a conditioned soul. And Krishna now is dispelling that doubt. So if you quote Arjuna and say, I can't control my mind, even Arjuna said it, that you're using you're misunderstanding the context of those of that instruction of that conversation. Does that make sense? It was our Krishna, you know, often Krishna inspires Arjuna to say certain things, right? To speak as a conditioned soul, to reflect the doubts that we have so that he can dispel them because the guru is supposed to dispel doubts. And, um, Sometimes in a Bhagavatam class, someone will, will present a question, which is a doubt that they don't have, but they know a lot of people in the class have it, and they want to present that doubt on behalf of others, so it gives the speaker the opportunity to dispel it. So that's actually what's happening. So Krishna says, yeah, it's difficult. Okay. We all know that already. That's not, that's not news for us. It's difficult, but it's possible by practice and detachment. So um, now the word sadhana means practice. And the word sadhya means the result or the goal, the conclusion. So sadhana, we practice to get the sadhya, which is Krishna consciousness, the goal. So Krishna is telling Arjuna, yeah, yeah it is difficult to control the mind. And the fine print in between the lines, which Krishna didn't say, is, yeah, because it's conditioned for millions of lifetimes to think in a certain way. So you have to practice. How do you know? You have a bad habit. You have to replace it. You have to practice. So every way that your mind thinks that you don't want it to think, you have to reprogram it to think the way you want it to think. And if you don't reprogram it, it's going to continually think the way you don't want it to think if you do nothing about it. And then that reprogramming, as Krishna says, you have to practice it. It's like, it's like vigilant. Like all the time. Practica todo el tiempo. Controla el, la, el mente, la mental. Control, control, 
control our lamenting. We have to practice totally of temple. Hmm. So there, there's two aspects that I was speaking about earlier before some of you came. One aspect is, is affirming the way, my dear mind, this is this is where we're going, this is how we're thinking, but also acting that way. You, know, you have to do it in both levels. Um, the mind says go right, and then you go left, and the mind's learning, oh, we're starting to go left. You're you're teaching the mind, oh, we go left. So your whole life you went right. And now you decided to go left. So the mind is starting to learn. Oh, there's a new program here. We're going. The left is the new program. But if you only go left one out of 10 times, the mind doesn't learn it. But if you always go left, the mind's like, oh, we're, we're going left now. Right? So you have, to you have to be consistent in your action. And until the mind is consistent in following your action, you have to be consistent with your mind in reminding it. And... The thing is, I think a lot of us, because the mind is so powerful, some of us, but we just give up on it. But I want to, I want to tell you that that affirming what you want to do is extremely powerful, because the mind will just, it just will tend to jump according to say, no, this is what we're doing, this is how we're thinking, this is where we're going. You'd be surprised how the mind will follow that. You'd be surprised how powerful that is. Now. There's another thing, and this may be a little more difficult. If if I tell you to tell your mind, you're like you're thinking, you know, I can't do this, and you're always failing at it, and I say, well, program your mind to to program your mind to believe that you can do it. So you say you say to yourself, I can do this but inside you don't believe it. Have you ever done that? You tell your mind something, is it? But while you're saying it, you don't believe it. So what do you think happens? Pretty much nothing. Because the mind knows you don't believe it. The mind's like, ha, ha, ha. You say, let's go left. You want to go left. You don't believe you can go left. You're right. When you get to the corner, you're going to go right because that's your comfort zone. So the so it's it's we want to affirm, but as you know from the self care course, I explained to you that when you do the affirmations, you have to feel them. You have to believe into them. They have to be real for you. Otherwise, how do you going to convince your mind it's real if you don't even believe it? Right. So when I say I can do this and I'm trying to convince the mind, I have to emotionally feel that I can do it. And because if I just say, you know, so many people say this, affirmations don't work. And the reason is because they're saying something and feeling the opposite. I can do this and inside they say, they're feeling, I cannot do this, no puede. Dice a la mental, yo puede, pero cien, cien. Siente, no puede. And I feel I can, but I say I can. It doesn't work that way. So if you say, well, you know, I tried the affirmations, they don't work. It's because you didn't believe any of them. You just recited them, which is um, something we talk about a lot. Like you hear something in class and you don't feel it. And so you don't do it because you don't feel it. You only know it. And knowing is, you know, part of it, but um, you don't. I always see knowing as potential. It's like, you know, I tell you what you should eat to to heal yourself. So all that is is potential. Like you, you have you have potential to heal yourself. That's all. But until you actually feel like doing it, probably you won't do it. Right? So we've talked about this a lot, about how important it is to transfer what you know to your heart. 
so that you feel like acting on it instead of just knowing. Because knowing is like, it's a, knowing means like I have the option to act that way. I always have the option to act a certain way because I have the knowledge, but um, it doesn't mean I will. So, yeah, I think it's extremely important to understand that. So if I say, you can control your mind, and you say, I know I can control my mind, but you don't feel you can, you won't. It's not possible. So that, that's important. So affirming, affirming, I'm going to do this, or affirming, I'm not going to do this, or affirming, I'm not going to do this, and you feel it, you feel the emotion of that. You feel connected. I want to do that, and I, I feel inspired to do that. You're going to do it. But if you say, I want to do it, but you don't feel it, probably you're not going to do it. You agree? You have that experience? Yeah. And that's why... That's why we say, I know I should do this, but I don't feel like it. And therefore, we don't do it because we don't feel like it. So we all know this. I know I should, but I don't feel like it. She can sit on the bed if she wants. We hear you better. So, every time I say, every time I say, can you close that a little bit? Because uh, the Brahmana Fulgence is on over here. Yeah, that's good. Um, every time I say, I know I should, but I don't feel like it, you should realize you have a problem of knowledge in your head and not in, and not in your heart and so that so that that statement should reveal to you there's a problem here i want to do something but i don't feel like doing it right and so the question we should ask ourselves is how can i get the feeling to do this and then when we make the affirmation, I want to do this, and we actually feel like we want to do it, then it's very easy to reprogram your mind. That if you don't feel it, you're going to have a trouble. And so I would therefore request anything you want to do, ask yourself, what must I do to be, a, to be motivated to want to do this? We were talking about this I think, yesterday, the day before. I know I shouldn't get up early, but if you don't want to, you won't, right? And so then, then if I know I should get up early, but I don't want to, and therefore I don't, the natural question I should ask myself is, how could I develop the desire to get up early? What, what way of thinking, what way of looking at rising early? What in what? What do I have to read? What do I have to think? What do I have to do to become inspired? Right? To be able to do that. Have you ever heard a class or read a book, seen a movie, documentary, and somebody said, or even just an interview, and somebody said something? And that one thing, there is an emotional reaction in your body. We call that an epiphany, an aha moment. Aha. Uh -huh. You have that in Spanish? Aha. Uh -huh. But but you know, you're sitting listening and there's not much emotion. And all of a sudden one thing is said and you feel like, oh, it's amazing. And it was like, you know. The heavens just opened and you saw the light. 
isn't it? And probably you'll never forget that your whole life, right? Yes? And probably at that point, something in your life changed. Some do something shifted all the way. So that shows us how knowledge alone is insufficient. There has to be. You have to believe into it on an emotional level. You don't like. Some people met Prabhupada. And as soon as they saw him, they were overwhelmed with this feeling that this is the guru. This is my eternal guru. And they surrendered. Other people saw Prabhupada. Nada. Didn't feel anything. Didn't feel anything, didn't do anything. Heard his class and that was it. It's not for me. No. It was interesting. Class was interesting. Is that due to choice or like past life? Prabhupada, she's asking, was that due to choice or due to past life? Prabhupada always answered that question with choice. And although philosophically you would say it's it's also past life does have an influence, obviously. But Prabhupada didn't want us to rely, put too much reliance on past life. Because if you have a problem, you could blame it on your past life. Well, it's just, you know, it's my conditioning, you know, my samskars. I have bad samskars. And in everything that I've read that would answer this question, it was always like, it's possible if you take to the process. Like, like the future is, is equally open to everyone. Maybe someone's too impious to do it. And, and maybe you... You can't force the emotion, obviously. But our our point is that if you really know that this is what you want, but you're not feeling it, then you have to work on getting the feeling because that's where the motivation comes. Is how you're going to fight your mind. How are you going to fight your mind for the things that you want unless you feel the beauty of it? Like, like for example, there are a lot of devotees who are very austere, and very sense controlled. When they think of sense control, they have a very beautiful feeling that comes over them. When they think of fasting, it's like, it's a very good feeling. There's all these positive emotional connections to austerity, to sense control. You know, when I control myself, I feel powerful. So they look at sense control as something beautiful. And sense gratification is something destructive. So, so that's probably just taken over from the last life. But we can learn from that, that that anything that you want to do that's difficult, it has to become beautiful to you. So if I walk away from something that's not good for me, but that I like, and I, I have a... How should I say this? When I see that thing, what, ins what inspires me is to walk away from it. That's where my positive feelings are, walking away. So if there's something that you're attached to that's not healthy for you, 
and you have very a very positive emotion about walking away from it, it's going to be easy to walk away from it. And you'll be happy every time you do. It, and you'll feel good. We have a we have a stand somewhere, but I'm not sure. Um, no, I don't know. Anurada has it. She's got to be close to the. So the thing that we want to do. That, that may be difficult for us to do. We have to have some beauty around doing it. Like, like I want to get up early, but I don't like getting up early. I have to have some beauty around that. So it's like when I look at it, it's like, yeah, it's beautiful. Or, or I have some weakness and I have to surround that thing with the beauty of, of the beauty of me walking away. So every time I look at it, I feel like, oh, it's beautiful to walk away. That's, you know, that's what, what I stand for is that. And therefore walking away enforces what I believe, that I'm living what I believe. And if you, if you, Look at the life of an advanced devotee. You can see this is, is actually just the way they live. Like they, walking away from sense gratification is just, it's, that's their happiness. Isn't it? It's their happiness. I can, you want this? No. That's their happiness to say no. So that's um, that's one of the ways, best ways to deal with the mind. And when the mind says, well, actually, you want that. Because we've trained the mind to want it. We just have to say, no, I don't want it. And I don't want you to want it. And if we do that enough, and we walk away from it enough, then the mind will stop gravitating towards it. It just won't want it because we've reconditioned it. So this is, um, I think it's so important to understand, the mind is not just free, freely going towards sense gratification. We, we have worked on it. We have worked on programming it that way. And so then it's obvious, right? Well, if I've worked to program it that way, I might as well work to program it some other way. Right? That makes sense? So um, that was just an introduction to the, to kind of what I've been thinking about lately. And um, you can think of so many scenarios in your life where you could do one thing or do another thing, make the wrong choice or the right choice. And you can just kind of make a movie in your mind of how I'll feel if I make the wrong choice and how I'll feel if I make the right choice. And it's good to play that movie when you're tempted. And when you, when you play that movie, then hopefully you walk away. And that will be your greatest happiness. And you'll realize this is what I stand for. This is what I believe. Walking away from this is what I believe. This is what I live for. This is what I'm being trained to do. And you'll feel very powerful. And when you feel powerful, then it's like you you next time is going to be easier. And next time is easier. And next time is easier. And vice versa. So every time you give in, you're training your mind to give in. And then you say it's so hard. Yeah, because you keep training your mind to give in. And then we suffer. 
So, so nothing can be more beautiful and satisfying than, than to be feeling what our philosophy teaches us to feel, right? There's nothing more beautiful than that. So I, I, I came up with a, a document or two or three, and it has some ideas here. Um, some quotes from Shastra. And uh, maybe be a little selective, just so we can stay uh, focused on what we're talking about. An uncontrolled mind is like a disease. If not cured, it will continue to harass one. So I think that <laughs> summarizes what we have spoken about. This is from a God brother. In our conditioned state, we learn to live with this attachment we have that we don't want. You ever have an attachment that you really don't want it? And the attachment to Krishna that we don't have, but we want. This is our this is our material condition. I'm attached to things. I don't really want, and I really want Krishna, I'm not attached. So that's the predicament. And what I personally do when, when I analyze things this way, then my first thought is, okay, so what can I do to change it? So what can I do to dislike the attachment I have and like the attachment I want to have? that I don't have. Yeah. So if I'm attached to something, <laughs> I have to be able to look at that attachment in a way, I have to train myself, think about it in a way that I wouldn't be attached. In other words, I see all the, the negative aspects of it and vice versa. I see all the positivity in Krishna consciousness. You desire, you act, you get a body according to those actions. Material nature gives the body, but you were the cause. Now, this is interesting. Okay, so in the Gita, Krishna says, prakriti kriya manani, gunani karmani sarvasha. The modes of nature are doing everything. If the modes of nature are doing everything, then everything I just said in this class would be false, right? Because I'm talking about like talking to your mind, controlling it, trying to reason with it, and so forth. So we have to, both things are true, right? So if I have the temperature in this room to 40, 45 Celsius, outside it right now is about 18 or something. If you decide to come in this room and stay here, you're gonna start sweating. And the reason you're sweating is because the room is hot. But you decided to come in. So the modes of nature are acting, but we're playing with those modes. Right? We're, we're making a decision to live in passion or ignorance, and then those modes will start working on us. Now, you're sweating, but you could leave this room anytime you want. Or maybe it's so hot, you're sleepy, you're lazy, you don't want to get up. But if you don't get up, you're going to continue to sweat. 
So the modes of nature are doing everything, but according to our actions and our consciousness, we're associating with those modes. You know, like you want to cool off, you put on air conditioning. So you want to cool off Maya, you put on the air conditioning of Satwaguna, and then you cool off. But you're, the air conditioning is cooling you off, but you decided to turn it on. So it feels like we're not in control. In some sense, it's true. But we're choosing the modes which are going to control us. And and you can also choose Vishuddha Sattva. You can also choose to be in the transcendental world, and that will affect you with all kinds of spiritual motivations and realizations. And and when you're in that more sattvic state or vishuddha sattvic state, then Krishna gives you intelligence how to work through all your problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is an interesting quote here. This is really, this one is just like hits the nail on the head. The mind is always planning how to stay in the material world. So, you know, you may not consciously think that that's what the mind is doing, but, but every time we're focused on something which is not Krishna conscious, and that, that's what's basically happening. It's causing us to it will cause us to take birth again in this world, according to our attachment. So then Prabhupada continues, the entanglement of materialism comes from the material mind. Now, so really the purpose of, of this particular class is to convince us that we do have control of the mind, even though it's difficult. Mm -hmm. yeah. so you have some questions and I'm going to look at your questions go back and see what you've been saying and I'm sure all your questions are going to be like so difficult to control my mind and I, I don't know how to do it I tried and failed I'm so fallen rascal i can't do it anyway we'll deal with it I, like i said in the beginning of the class i said you're all going to understand what i'm saying but not everyone's going to have an easy time doing it and, and i think the the key word here is practice this, this is not like you hear this class and you go okay that was a nice class no this is something you do you have to practice because the mind, it's, you know, it's it's working all the time. Um, while talking with the mind, sometimes it becomes totally crazy and takes to past fears. Um, yeah. Well, I was, I was, um, yesterday we, Drove. We were we were at another temple, so we drove back for five hours or so. And for five hours, I'd listen to Prabhupada memories the whole way back. And one interesting thing, I mean, if you listen to that much, you know, you hear devotees telling stories about so many different situations that Prabhupada dealt with and so many instructions that Prabhupada gave. So in answer to your question, Prabhupada had complete faith in the holy name to solve every problem. Problem. The problem is we just don't, we're not chanting on that level. But when a devotee had a problem, he'd say, just keep chanting. It's the only solution. And, and the devotee will say, but I have been chanting. 
And I'll say, really? You've really been chanting? Well, if you were really chanting, you wouldn't have this problem. I mean, Takaharidas didn't have any problems. Takaharidas had no problems with Maya, right? Maya came personally, like no problem. So what, what's the lesson? Yeah, if you chant like Takaharidas, you also have no problem. Um, so that was Prabhupada's faith, and I, and I think we need we need to understand the ultimate solutions are spiritual, and and but it's it's a paradox because if I have material problems, I can't chant well, and so then because I'm not problems, <laughs> so this is how I deal with it, and everybody's not me, but I'll tell you how I think. Um, any emotion that you have that's not helping you advance in spiritual life. You want to condition yourself to only to, to discard those emotions which don't help you and then bring on emotions that help you. You ever have a feeling and it's just like it's not helping you materially or spiritually? So we want to condition ourselves to bring forth thoughts and emotions that are helpful and condition ourselves to be able to let go of thoughts and emotions that are not helpful. So I have a fear and I look and I think, well, you know, because of this fear, I'm not able to do what I really need to do. You know, it's like sometimes we say, Prabhu, here's your book bag. Go out on the street and talk to people. And you're like, ah, I can't do it. No one's going to stop. Someone's going to spit on me. You know, you have all these fears. You know? And so any of you have ever overcome your fears, what did you do? Eventually you just did it because you know your fear would paralyze you. So you just, okay, we're just going to do it in spite of the fear. Right? It's basically, you have two choices. Don't do it or do it in spite of the fear. And so you realize, well, I need to do it. So I'm managing those emotions by not allowing that emotion to handicap me. Now, if you if you study books on self-development, this is one of the things they'll teach you. Don't be handicapped by your emotion. That um, it... You know, a lot of us think, and this is this is really, really bad. A lot of us think, because I have a certain emotion, I have to act on it. And we and we don't realize that the guy next door who's up early in the morning and running in the park and very successful, he's got the same emotions. He's got the same negative emotions you do, but he's he knows how to deal with it better than you do. Not like he's not envious and he's he's not attracted to things which could divert him, even though he's a materialist. And it's not that he doesn't have fears. You know, he's invested millions of dollars in his business. Of course he has fears. He could lose it all. But he knows how to manage it. Because this is important to understand. Otherwise, we think other people don't have the problems we have. And I've said many times, I think it should be obvious that anyone who has a body has more or less the same problems. Body likes to eat, likes to sleep, likes to mate, likes to defend. What's defending? Jealousy, criticism, and all of that. It's all part of defending the false ego, competing for sense gratification. Like, you have a body, you have this. So, Really, what differentiates successful people is their ability to manage those emotions in a way that it will not, number one, not get in the way of where they want to go, and number two, help them go where they want to go. And and if, if you read anything Prabhupada said about the mind, said how to deal with the mind, ne ignore it, neglect it. So it, it's, it's sometimes an emotion. If you listen to it, it's just going to take you away from Krishna consciousness. So you have to just act in spite of it. 
And then we're we're developing a new way, a new strategy, a new way of living. So it becomes easier next time. It's it's this is such an important point. You know, sometimes you have to do something and it's really difficult. And it's like I can't do it. It's so hard. Right. Especially one of the things that's common is like facing some problem I don't want to face. You know, I just don't want to talk about it. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to face it. But it's really, really important to remember it's going to be harder tomorrow to deal with it if you don't face it today and start correcting it. And every time you act in spite of that fear, every time you walk away from that temptation, tomorrow it's easier to do it. And this is how you recondition yourself. And that, and then you'll come to a point where that's just what you do. You don't have to even try anymore. It's just you naturally do it, right? Like you look at a devotee, um, you know, like a very good devotee. Their sadhana is like it's like an automatic. They just do it. It's not even like they think. It's just you know, chant, study, you know, it's just like, because they develop those habits. Right, but it wasn't necessarily easy. Every day you try to chant japa well, it's easier the next day, and vice versa. And we all have experience, don't we? Yeah, especially the experience that a lot of us have is bad japa over a long period of time. And then we don't even know how to chant good japa. It's like, we don't even know what good japa is. We forgot. And that's why we have these japa retreats. And the japa retreats kind of just, like an atom bomb, just shocks us into good japa. Five, six days of just chanting. Yeah. And then you go to the japa retreat and you think, okay, now I've got to continue doing this because if I don't, I'm going to fall back into that bad habit. So it's really important to be aware of this when something is difficult to do, but it's something that needs to be done, that if you do it, it's going to be a little bit easier to do it tomorrow. And if you don't, it's going to be a little more difficult to do it tomorrow. And if you want to make your life easier, just do it. You know, um, a lot of times Prabhupada would say, what is the difficulty? What are the and and it, would, and it would be followed by just do it. Before Nike said just do it, Prabhupada said just do it. But um, when Prabhupada's saying what is the difficulty, it means just do it. Like, and it means there is no difficulty. You just think there is. That's what what is the difficulty means. It's a rhetorical statement. There is no difficulty except in your mind. So it's good to know that. Oh, this seems difficult, but that's my imagination. And if I if I want to make life easy for myself and I, I want to do something and I keep telling myself it's difficult, that's not making it easy for myself. It's just making it harder. Right? Um, I have a little... I do a little funny thing sometimes when we're on a morning walk. There'll be like a little log or a little curve and I'll tell everybody, can you walk on this? And they go, sure. And they walk on it. And they say, was that easy? And they say, yeah, that was, that was easy. I said, if this little piece of wood you walked on was between two buildings, a hundred stories in the air, would it be harder to walk on it? Yeah, of course. Right? Why? Because you're starting, you're like, I can't fall. So instead of thinking about just walking, you're thinking about, this is hard if I, I could fall and kill myself. So if you're trained to do it properly, you're not going to think like that. You just go walk straight. Right? So there'll be a lot of fear walking across it, although it's easy. And now because of the fear, it's like, and I'm not going to do this. This is dangerous. 
where you could walk across it with your eyes closed when it's on the ground. So, um, so we would we would naturally think if if we want to make our life easy that if I didn't have this fear, it would be a lot easier to do this. If I had a little more confidence. And so I kind of pet myself, no, I can do this. This can be done. Let's let's try. If I can't, it's not a problem. No loss. If I don't try, nothing happens. If I try and I fail, nothing happens. So no loss. So so we're we're trying to adjust. We're always trying to adjust our thinking, our emotions, intelligence to make things easier for us. And, it, and the more you do that, the more you think, how I can do this? How can this be easier? Krishna will show you how. Krishna will give you the power to neglect that thought. Krishna will give you the power not to act on that emotion. Krishna will give you this vision. Oh, if I walk away, that's a celebration. I'll, I, I could celebrate. I'll be so happy if, to be able to do that. You know, um, let me tell you about my life before I was right before I was a devotee. I, I live, I was going to school in a place called Berkeley, California. And, and Berkeley, California was one of the most, if not the most liberal places in America, maybe in the world. Well, maybe Amsterdam is more liberal, but it was very liberal. That means um, sex, drugs, and rock and roll pervaded. And um, I came to this point in my life where I felt like sexual connection with a woman, um, it was just like, it was like, what's the point? The, there's billions of people in the world we could be serving and we're just trying to enjoy one another. It was like, that was my thought. But I was only 19 and very well trained how not to be a brahmachari from the age of about 12 or 13. I had full training on non-brahmachari life. So, um, and and that sexual desire um, and the sexual energy that was so pervasive on the campus that I was so susceptible to, it was always bothering me. I didn't want it, but it was like, you know, the girls were just half-dressed and very promiscuous. And you know, when you know you can have something, it, it's disturbing. If you, if it was a hundred years ago, it wouldn't matter if the girls were beautiful because they wouldn't even talk to you. But not only would they talk to you, they would do a lot more than talk. So it was very disturbing. And then I, when I became a devotee, it was it, I felt internally, I have made a declaration to leave that world, I felt so good. I felt like I just conquered the universe. I, I walked away from that thing, which every is, con is controlling everybody. And I felt like, I felt so good. I was like, yes. I was like, ah. It's like it all left me, right? So that's what we need to be doing. And if we do it well and embrace it, we can feel that, yes, I've just conquered the universe because I conquered my own mind and heart and senses. And if, and if we identify that with real power, this is power, this is my power. And with real beauty, and, and we identify that with living in integrity, this is what I believe and I'm actually doing what I believe. And I'm doing it with my body and my heart and my mind. What what could be a greater feeling than that? Right? Yeah. And what could be a worse feeling than giving into the very thing I believe to not give into? Right? That's why, you know, I want to make you feel bad now. So please excuse me. But I'm just going to repeat Prabhupada's words. Prabhupada was asked, what, what about a devotee who falls down? And Prabhupada said, a devotee does not fall down. And what he meant was, 
when you take initiation and you make a vow, you don't fall down. That's it. A de, you know, if you're actually a devotee, then you've made that commitment, you're a devotee, you will figure out somehow or other how to follow it. So so every, and Prabhupada said some other things that'll make you feel really bad, and I won't say them. But um, the point is, do you really want to take initiation? Because when you take initiation, you are saying, this is what I'm going to do. Come hell or high water, this is what I'm going to do. And so, and so you have to figure out how you can do that, right? So all these things I'm saying are just strategies to help you deal with your condition, which are absolutely necessary, especially if we're if we're if we take an initiation. It, it's like getting married. It's like once you get married, you have to throw the word divorce in the toilet. You you can't and you have to. No matter how difficult it is, you got to figure out. Unless your husband or wife is like going to kill you or something, or kill you emotionally, but in normal circumstances, you got to figure out how to make it work. That's your job, right? So, you know, a lot of you probably know this, but a lot of what I teach, you'll go, "Where is that written?" And I'll say, well, it's kind of here or there, but this was my realization. You know, I read so many things, but in, in, in order to advance in Krishna consciousness, I was always trying to think what to do, what would make it easy, how I could do this. And I would, Krishna would say, well, think this way, act this way, feel this way, contextualize it this way, understand the philosophy this way. So that's what happens. So that's all I'm, everything I said in this class is just my own practice and realization. And so you'll have the same, you could give the same class if you if you actually make the effort. Um, yeah. Anandita, I actually answered your question. She's saying is the best way to control the mind, refine the character. So I saw your question when I came back and I said, not only do you have to think this way, you have to act this way. Act the way you're thinking. Um, so even if my mind is saying, I should be unkind to this devotee because for whatever reason I have, I should act in a kind way. And because actions affect the mind and actions change the mind. So if we can think, if we can't, if I, if I can't think the way I want to think, at least I can act the way act that way because the action will then alter the thinking. So you have thinking your way into an action and acting your way into a thinking. It, it, it works both ways. But um, if we're aligned with thinking, action, and feeling, then it's going to be pretty easy. And so what I, what I would say is another beautiful moment we can experience is I don't feel like acting in a certain way but I do it anyway, because this is the way I'm supposed to act. And then by acting that way, you'll feel like I felt, like I just conquered the universe today, because I didn't feel like acting. I, I really had an issue with this devotee, but I appreciated them. And by doing that, I feel like that was the right thing to do. And I felt like I, I've, I've felt and acted in the proper way. And you know, you know the problem with modern society? We have this paradigm that you can sensualize your way into happiness, right? Sensualize, sense gratification. And, and, and so, you know, that's why everybody wants money because you can buy more sense gratification and the ideas that'll make you happy. But when you actually act in integrity with what you believe, that's when you become happy, right? So Anandita, when you're rich and famous, you can buy a Rolls Royce. But if you're not living in integrity, 
with your values, you'll be run really miserable Rolls Royce driver, but you'll be very comfortable, but miserable. Right? So sense gratification gives you pleasure. Money can give you pleasure. Money can give you comfort. But happiness is, is coming from the way we think, the way we act. So when we as devotees act in integrity with our philosophy, it's impossible not to be happy and vice versa. You know, this is what's going on. I'm going to be very honest here. What's going on a lot in ISKCON is that we act out of integrity and we're not happy. And then we go to the temple, we go to Kirtan and we're ecstatic and we're transcendental, but we come back and we sink back into our life where we lack integrity. And it's very confusing because you, am I happy or am I miserable? Actually, you're miserable, but by the mercy of Mahaprabhu, temporarily you're ecstatic. But unless you keep that going, how will how will you be happy? You'll just be like a you'll be going to the spiritual world and down to hell and spiritual world and to hell. So that even though you know, like devotees will say, Well, I'm a devotee, but I'm not happy. But I saw you dancing in ecstasy. The, yeah. You were in ecstasy, but when that stopped, I'm not happy because I'm not living in integrity with what I believe. Correct? Does that make sense? Do you see that? Yeah. It's like, it's kind of obvious if you just open your eyes. Uh, there's a lot of very unhappy devotees that are very ecstatic. Isn't it? Very ecstatic. I mean, you're taking this amazing prasadam in association with devotees. That's like so ecstatic. And then the, the kirtans, the classes, as the parikramas. But we have to remain in our daily lives in integrity with what we're being taught, how to live, how to think. That's where the happiness remains constantly. And that's and that's the point of this class is to put the power into your hands to do that. That you have the power to do that. But you have to reason with your mind and emotions. You can't just let them take you for a walk in, in the wrong direction. Does that make sense? Mm. 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 Sydney says she has to trick her mind. Yeah, sometimes. Trick your mind. Set your alarm clock for the time you have to take medicine. Then you have to get up. Yeah. Or you could... You could have, a, if you're an engineer, you could have a pot of ice cold water above your bed and a little device at 4 a.m. that goes, boop, pours it on your face. Yeah, that would work also. But um, ultimately, I think the real the real way is to, you know, to develop it in our heart. Um, sometimes when we're trying to redirect the mind, we may be ne neglecting some needs that we have. For example, we want to get up early, but we... We may be trying to develop that habit at the expense of lack of sleep. How can we differentiate between the talk of the mind, which is due to our conditioning, and presenting some actual needs that we have? Yeah. So this is, um, I I would say this is like the eternal. Um, this is like the eternal problem for devotees. What what's good spiritually? may be bad materially, what's good materially may be bad spiritually. And uh, Prabhupada really wanted us to be up early in the morning. Yeah. And he wanted us to take care of his health. And that that's how I'm going to answer your question. You, you do what you have to do. I think we have to continue this class on Wednesday because we still have questions. It's time to start the japa. And so Chaitanya Dasi, can you can you save these questions? These are really this is a really important topic. And um really if we were to sum it up, I would just say, you know, be very thoughtful, introspective, and real. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. It's time for breakfast in Mexico. Um I've already chanted my rounds, so I'll have to say goodbye. Adios amigos. Thank you.
Uh, we'll see you on Wednesday.